Like what you're hearing? Check out more Cellar Door Skeptics every week right here on Spreaker and iTunes. Make sure you come back and check out new episodes with your hosts, Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna. And always remember, prepare for the revolution. Now, back to the show. Walk with me through the cellar door. A storm is coming, Francis. A portal to a more skeptical world. Cellar door skeptics begins right now. Prepare for the revolution with your hosts, Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna. Oh, welcome to another amazing episode of Cellar Door Skeptics Podcast. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we uh, are back with episode 145. Tonight, uh, it's not as much of a variety cast tonight, you know. Hey, I think I just named the new type of a podcast, Variety Cast. I don't think anybody's ever said that. I could, I, I think that could work. <laughs> I mean... We don't exactly cast. we don't hold hands and do the song at the end of the show like a lot of variety shows are used to, but I think just about yeah. everything else would would match. We do some funny stuff. We cry a little bit. Uh, we get drunk and sing Jim. Uh, uh, what's the guy's name? Dean. Dean. <laughs> uh, I can never remember his name. Come on, dude. I have no idea what you're saying. I don't remember uh, singing with you. No, that's Did what I'm we saying. Really sing like, together. They, there was there was a Dean Martin. Dean Martin show used to he, they, basically the show was famous because Dean pretended to be hammered all the time. He you know, always had a glass in his hand. So it's like sometimes it's our shows end like a Dean Martin show where we're 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 sort of singing uh, and we're having a good time, but it, it's real. And Dean Martin may have been faking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he probably was faking. I definitely do not fake the drinking. Nope. But. Nope. We have a good time. It's it, it, this is kind of like our letting off steam thing, you know, like a hobby where we get to just relax and talk. Steam and have cast. The steam cast. Oh, nope, we can't do that because uh, um, the guys that created Half Life, Gearbox, and uh, all them, they they got steam and they got that probably in the thirty different IPs, probably because they have the steam sale and all the uh, video about game stuff on that. Cast. So. We are no, steaming. That's way too close to a Cleveland <laughs> steamer, and I don't want to ever be that closely associated with something like that. I, so. I was thinking of like a steaming cup of Joe, you know, or like lattes and stuff like that. Okay, well, we'll nope, put it on right. the internet. We'll let everyone say, do you, th- when you hear the word steaming, do you think of coffee <laughs> or dog garbage? Oh. Like a, a giant dog loaf uh, in your yard. Which you one be, do you pick? You better put a survey up this week, Hannah. I want to see uh, a survey maybe, on the website. Yeah. I'm going to go vote. I'm going to go okay. vote. As soon as you put that up, that's going to go for a vote. Okay. We'll put that up on our Facebook page later. That's your week. one goal for this week. You have Done. no other goals. Done. I'm connecting to my brain right now. All right. Make sure, make sure you write it down too. Maybe in, in a purple pen. I don't know, blue pen. Something that stands out for you. A brown pen. I have a, a brown, brown pen. pen. Well, <laughs> then you're just gonna have a predisposition to think that's what steaming really means. And in the uh, long yeah. run, you're just actually wrong about this. Yeah, we talked predispositions on the the interview for this week. It's a pretty good one. I mean, it gets a lit. It gets a little bit out there into uh, places that we don't really hit on the show. We talk a lot about mythology and stuff. I thought it was. I thought it was fun and lightning. We're gonna. We'll let everybody um, give us your thoughts on whether or not you agree, disagree. If you think we, you know, should die, have another interview and see if we can find out some more and break apart these arguments a little bit more, just let us know. Yeah, but before we get to the interview, there's one topic and only one that we really, really, really wanted to talk about tonight. Well, let's, um, let's say who the interview is with too, just for the oh, beginning of the show. For people. Sorry. Yep, the interview is with. Uh, good, good job catching that one-handed. <laughs> the interview is with Bernie Taylor. He is the author of Before Orion. And he has an amazing book. He actually has a book before that that I'm not quite sure uh, what it's about, but I believe it's about astronomy. And, um, it was Biological Time or something, wasn't it? No, that's that's the thing that started that starts his book off. Oh, okay. But he, he, uh, he, he's an amazing author. He reached out to us, uh, gave us a bunch of information. 
we had a chat with him and then decided to bring him on the show because we thought it would be a good conversation. And, and one of the things, you know, that, you know, we talk about on the show, right, is we talk about the multiverse sometimes. We talk about time travel sometimes because those things interest us. This is another topic from a skeptic's realm that we felt was an interesting conversation, even if, you know, in the long run, we don't agree 100 percent. He doesn't agree 100 percent with us. We thought it was a really good conversation because um, we're both skeptics inside of the uh, of religion and we're both having the same type of conversation we were just able to have a conversation you know contrary to what sam harris thinks without sexism (laughs) and you know egotisticism and all that other stuff so well it was a short conversation too like this conversation could last for four hours like one of our old crazy youtube casts we used to do so like so like that's another thing is anyone takes a listen to it let us know if you want to hear some more back and or check out his book and and give us a review i mean we we like to see what everybody thinks like because this is an area we haven't done too much in lately when we talk about the origins of religion and debunking certain myths and stuff we've gotten a little more towards science and politics so if you want to hear more of that kind of stuff let us know yep but speaking of politics there was an article that came out from the washington post Called political nonprofits must now name many of their donors under federal court rulings after the Supreme Court declines to intervene, and I think this is a very unique uh, a decision on the Supreme Court side. Given the mix. surprising, yeah, like this is not something I would have expected. It's it's kind of one of those things where you know you got the headline today, and I was like, holy crap! This, there's no way this is true. There's no way that this is something that could ever have gone through a gop you know a supreme court but well, it, it surprised but it me that they didn't want, they didn't want to touch it that's the thing that surprised me because they have the they have a conservative majority in this type of thing um when it talks about you know the donors and and having that that uh that black box having that that independence and freedom to not disclose who is giving money that's something that you know the coke foundation and a lot of those kinds of groups like to funnel money uh, a lot of religious organizations like to funnel money into places where so you don't know what religious organization is they love that anonymity this is a big thing and that, that kind of transparency is something that the conservatives really like and they would think that with the conservative uh uh majority in the supreme court that they would probably want to take this up especially with the Kavanaugh thing pending. So I was surprised that they said they didn't want to touch this. Yeah, I I was too. And I guess it could kind of go both ways. You know, I mean, I I think about some of the information I know working with the CFI, right? Stuff I can't say on air, stuff that, you know, basically they're like, you understand this is like 100% confidential at the sign of these papers and stuff like that. I know certain things, you know, like one of them probably wouldn't be surprised to anyone, right? But, you know, there's certain donors and different things like that, that their names can't get out there. And, you know, on the other side of things, I kind of sit here and go, okay, what is this going to do for the atheistic nonprofits, right? Or the nonprofits that work uh, like Planned Parenthood, right? You know, not everybody wants to be associated with Planned Parenthood. Yeah. They just don't. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, this the, this article and this discussion kind of raises a, a unique thing for me as an individual because I'm torn, right? You know, on one side, I want to know who the hell is spending all their money you know, at Goodwill or some of these crazy, weird, conservative, you know, nonprofits that basically eat all the money and fund it into elections. Oh, they fund it into things in uh, Texas that say that uh, creationism is just (laughs) as valid as evolution and that we shouldn't talk about Thomas Jefferson anymore because he uh, he cut up the Bible into a more he he cut up his Bible into a Cliff's Notes version that had all of the real stuff in it. And the rest of it was frivolous, like those kinds of things. There are political activist groups, PACs, uh, political activist committees that um, that are funding that and they don't want to know who there is. And, you know, I will I will say this, that I agree with you that a lot of people who do give money to uh, um, Planned Parenthood, a bunch of them may not want their names out there and to be that transparent. So I do understand that. And what that, one of the things that the, the, this is the conservatives in the, uh, the Washington Post were quoted and basically saying that they believe that this would cool down funding and cool down fundraising for the upcoming midterm because we're only 50 days away from the election. And so a lot of heavy giving and heavy funding starts happening right around now, especially since all the primaries are over and they're worried that this will cool down, you know, that last minute donor to uh, bringing stuff into the, television ads and i mean 
I don't know. I I I personally think that more people on the uh, the liberal side are going to be more open to you know being transparent. I don't think there's so much shame associated with a lot of the donors and political perspectives on our side as there is to um, the more conservative angles and like not wanting to be known that you're you're funding something that refuses to teach children sex ed and stuff like that. I don't know. I, just, I don't I don't see that that shame attached as much to th- funding things like Planned Parenthood. Do you really think that that would be a deterrent for people? Uh, I don't think it's as much of a deterrent as, you know, funding the super neoconservative Westboro Baptist Church or something like that. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I, I get that. They're actually in. And that's kind of the funny thing here is, you know, they talk about what the constraints are going to be for this. Right. For ignoring this. What does it mean? And while yeah, people who donate to Planned Parenthood may may become under some scrutiny because this isn't an actual declaration of law right going into effect. But the the difference is, is that they're actually talking about only people who are major political players raising money are forced to disclose the wealthiest donors. So, again, I guess if you were a multimillionaire donating to the Planned Parenthood, and and it's only going to go for how how it's affecting the actual elections, right? So, I mean, if your purpose is to just donate money, good for you. But if you're running for a political campaign, right, and you donated a bunch of money, you're kind of rubbing each other's backs, that's going to come out. And and I think that happens on both sides. I, I really don't think that's a... A conservative oh, oh. only theory, but I, I I do think it's, that you know when we look at the, the the difference between this, I agree with you in the aspect that yeah, the average person donating to Planned Parenthood isn't going to get as much flack because they're not doing it for a political you know jockeying position, right? Whereas if you donate to these pro life organizations and different things like that, you're you're using that as a jockey for your demographic maybe um one thing i I just wanted to you said like the wealthiest people what they they say in here the nonprofit advocacy groups which do not have to publicly disclose their donors as political committees do will now have to begin reporting the names of contributors who give more than two hundred dollars per per year towards their independent political campaigns campaign finance lawyers said so if you give more than two hundred dollars to any one particular group your name is going to show up as a major donor for that group I don't know how many people donate more than two hundred dollars to a group a year or multiple groups a year, but I will say that that is a pretty that's a pretty good uh, indicator of uh, uh, I guess you know a, an upper middle class or a uh, an upper class perspective because I give fifty dollars a year to the Foundation Beyond Belief, and I mean that's not a tiny amount of money, but it's also not a huge amount either. But I mean, I, I don't know. I, I I suspect that people making that fifty thousand, if their household's less than the eighty five thousand dollar a year mark, which is the uh, the ACA mark, where in the Affordable Care Act you are uh, you qualify for um, for funding to help you pay your health care in the uh, in the in the market. I, I have a hard time believing that people at that eighty five thousand or under mark are going to be spending more than two hundred dollars on one or more political activists groups i just that that seems you know that that's an area where you really have to make you know some sacrifices because of the cost of housing and increasing cost of of living and the increasing uh of um of inflation and then the the stagnant wages that we're seeing so like a lot of the economic things that are happening here would make that two hundred dollars kind of a, a little bit of a hurdle so maybe do you think do you think that's a high enough mark or should it should we just had it higher it should be five hundred or a thousand dollars uh, I would I would have rather seen it a little bit higher, but I kind of agree with you. I mean, you know, you know, I look at my family and we make well less than eighty five grand a year. So that's what I mean. Um, and like two hundred bucks to go somewhere that, that that would be a sacrifice. You would have to yep. concentrate to do that. And that and that's fair. And you know, like I said, you know, essentially we I give probably a total of you know three four hundred dollars a year, you know, minus whatever we give on the show. But, you know, it's not to one organization. It's it's actually to multiple organizations. But I have them set up to come out of my, you know, my account once once a month. Yeah, that's what I do with PayPal. It's a five dollars a month, I think is what it is. So yeah. that's what six that's sixty dollars a year. And I set that up years ago. And so like I mean, it's something I mean, I, I work hard for my money. <laughs> I'm doing eighty four hours a week right now. And it's just 
I don't know. It's just one of those things. Where, like it, it's a little bit, but I, I really think that like that two hundred dollar mark is good. But I think that it could be a little bit higher to give a little bit more um, trans, uh, like a little more comfort to people who are who aren't important. But you know, maybe five hundred or a thousand dollars because that'll show you someone who's really pushing some serious weight around. Yeah, and if you think about it this way, you know, when you when you look at things in life, right, <clears throat> and you're looking at this, and you go, "Well, do I really care?" If if let's let's say the middle class equals sixty percent of America, which it does, but. Let's pretend. Let's pretend we get there someday. If you think about, <laughs> if you think about it, right, that sixty percent, if they're able to give two hundred dollars, do I really care about the sixty percent? No, I, they're not the ones that I'm looking that I'm looking for. I'm looking yeah. for you know the individuals giving yeah the five hundred, the a thousand, the twenty grand a month, the ten grand a month, th- those type of things that are using it you know as a as a tax write off and tax shelter. And and B, I'm sitting there saying, okay, hey, great, but those are the ones that are more are going to be able to affect our nation a lot more because they're able to influence in ways that you and I just financially are never going to be able to do. And I don't know, maybe yeah, your well, company gives away a hundred grand a year. Who knows? <laughs> well, <laughs> no, we don't. And um, and it, it hurts me every time someone calls in asking for donations, and I have to tell them, like, listen, I can't even increase the pay of my employees, let alone start giving away money when I'm I am you know r- working to the bone and tax so hard. And so, I mean, I the, the Kentwood, I, I'm, we're, my company is in the city of Kentwood. We pay a lot in taxes, but I know a bunch of corporations in the general area that are way bigger than me, and they don't pay the you know the the the, the level of uh, orders of magnitude bigger than I am. They don't pay those percentages of the total that I pay for my total income, and it's just it you know it's it's unfortunate, and it's one of those things that it's a continuing to gripe. You know that that kind of flat tax idea, um, but in, in the end, like what, you, what basically what you were talking about is like having uh, the people who are really movers and shakers and putting a lot of money into this. The whole idea of like the Citizens United thing is that money is free speech. And uh, I just looked up real quick on uh, just a standard Google thing is uh, the class model, the middle class in the United States is people uh, located roughly between 52nd and 84th percentile in society. So their incomes are around thirty two and a half thousand dollars a year to sixty thousand dollars a year. And that was the, uh, the the distribution in 2005. That's what they're making this this um, distinction on. So if you're around that thirty to sixty thousand dollars a year, you are what is considered a middle class. And that's uh, 52nd to 84th percentile. And so there's 50% of the country who make less than $32,000 a year. Just just for you know some, some idea of what's happening here. And if you think about that, the number of people making $30,000 a year, how much are they donating to you know political activist campaigns? Probably none, if, if not just pennies. And uh, you know, a change in the uh, Salvation Army bucket, which is a terrible one to give money into. Anyways, that whole the whole point that I'm making here is that if, the, if Citizens United, they said that money is free speech. Essentially, that means that people with less money have a quantitatively lower amount of free speech. And that's a problem that I have here. It's like there is an I can mathematically evaluate how much free speech you have based on your yearly income. And that, to me, is a weighted system that gives people at the top way more power and influence than they really should have. Because in the idea of a representative democracy, the people who are representing you represent you equally uh, for and abroad and for your, your voice equally. And, and that that isn't true. And I don't think it's ever really completely been true in this country. But the whole <laughs> – that's you and I, like we, we like that whole, you know, that that moral equivalency uh, where we're we're actually looking at you know real democratic and uh, real representative systems. I don't I, I don't think we have it, and this is a great step towards kind of bringing that in. And it might hurt some people, but like I really think that we should be like pointing to all the people putting tons of money into the system. I would one hundred percent agree with that. Now, without further ado, here's our interview with Bernie Taylor. Author of Before Orion. Without further ado, please welcome to the show, Bernie Taylor. How are you tonight, sir? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on the show tonight. Yeah, it's awesome. And 
this this is a unique experience, and we're going to get into some of the uh, the dialogue in a, in a minute here um, that we had before the show. But uh, Bernie actually reached out to us and said, "Hey, have you heard about my book? Here's a bunch of speeches I've given. Would you you know Would you be interested in talking with me?" And the, the funny thing is, is about two and a half months ago, we actually did an interview with Hector Garcia about yeah. um, some of the origins of religion. And your book that recently came out in the last year, uh, Before Orion, Finding the Face of a Hero, kind of fits the discussion we had back then. So I thought, hey, let's have let's have Bernie on. And you also have a cool name, man. I mean, your name Bernie, for Christ's sake. <laughs> well, you know, if you Google my, Bernie Taylor, you're going to find a, a series of graphic um, novels of a character in New York City. Uh, it's a female character and all has to do with her rom- her sexual escapades. That's oh. <laughs> not me. I live in Oregon um, and that's entirely fiction. Uh, that's all. I, you know what? I did not do that. I only went off your website and the Amazon. I did not actually well, Google your name. Yeah, well, she's, she's entirely fictionist. It's a, it's another Bernie Taylor. Well, I uh, saw in your um, for your uh, I think it's your your Twitter username is Bernie T Taylor or, or is there an extra T in there Bernie somewhere? Bernie J. Bernie J. Bernie J. Bernie J. Bernie John is I, from my uh, grandfather. I searched I'm a for fourth. that and I got a uh, like a playwright and like a singer or something like that. And I was like, <laughs> okay, wait, I gotta go. I gotta go back to like books and Google, and then w- went to the Amazon. I checked the Goodreads, and so w- there's a bunch of great stuff out there, and we got a lot of synopsis. There's a lot of um, basically your bio is posted in, in multiple places. And so Chris and I were just kind of reading through and we we're just like trying to figure out exactly where and what and how, um, everything was going to tie in. And cause this is new to both of us. I didn't have a chance to read it. I listened to some of your, some of the, um, the videos. So everyone has, um, there's a, there's, there's some good content on YouTube that we'll throw some links into, uh, and you can actually see from his main page. So that'll be in our description as well. So yeah, we're definitely excited to get some cool questions and, uh, we'll see where the conversation goes. Well, I've given presentations to anthropologists, professional astronomers, um, and did an interview with a psychic, a few paranormal types, and <laughs> some history, some history podcasts. And everybody doesn't matter who they are; they ask the same question. Even the psychics, and the psychic isn't supposed to ask the questions; they're supposed to know the answer, right? But the, <laughs> the, everybody asks the same question. And let's see if you guys ask that tonight. All right, you should send it. You should like write it down. <laughs> no, then you, I'm not. You, you guys, you, then, then, you you be, then you could show us later and be like, "Look, here's no, that two question." Two thirds into it. Two thirds <laughs> well, into it, you guys are gonna say, "Well, following." We'll, we'll okay. be there. <laughs> well, well, what I'm hearing, I'm I'm hearing the uh, I Robot movie, where it's like that is the right question when he finally <laughs> gets the robots in front of a, what was it the golden gate bridge i believe it was out that or was that lake mackinac lake chicago something like mackinac bridge i can't remember which bridge it was but big uh span bridge in the background that was like this huge um thing for that uh, movie but all right anyway so chris i guess where did you want to start you want him to start with his bio or what were we going to do here sure that that's probably the best place to start is what's your background bernie and tell us a little bit about the beginning of the book Absolutely. Well, I see myself as a naturalist and an author. And the, the naturalists that we know of throughout time are Jane Goodall, um, Teddy Roosevelt, John Muir, um, and Charles Darwin. And they all start as independents. Jane Goodall didn't have a college, any college education. She became a primatologist. Um, Teddy Roosevelt was a hunter fisherman who then become, became a president conservationist. Charles Darwin, um, you know, he, he, was a free, he was a freelance passenger on a ship, um, and John Muir walked around in the woods. And what all those people have in common is the same thing that Native Americans had in common, as well as the Paleolithic people in Europe and the cave artists, is that they lived among the plants and the animals. And they, they, they were in the woods, and they're in the fields, and they're on the water. And so this journey for me started many years ago with another book titled Biological Time, which looked at the, the biological clocks of plants and animals. How does a, how does a flower, how do flowers bloom in synchrony? How does salmon migrate at the same time? I live out here in Oregon. We have sam- different species of salmon, and they, they shift a few weeks early, later from one year to the next. And so the kind of 
but the, the real in it earlier later because they all come in at the same time earlier later. So they have some other clock that's different from the way that we think or we gauge time. So biological time explored those concepts and how does how does a salmon know where where and when to be um, to be in, to in synchrony? And then I trace that back to the traditions of Native Americans. It's all in their calendars and people in um, in Europe from the distant time, as well as the Paleolithic caves in Europe in Europe. And I went to, I looked at images and I, and I, the nomenclature next to the, the taxonomic differences in these animals or what their stage of development was, was exactly the same as the biological clocks of how they work with these animals and the calendars of Native Americans, which makes sense because they're all hunter gatherers and they needed to be there for the, for these, for these animals. They didn't have Costco and they didn't have McDonald's and you know, <laughs> they couldn't wait for, on the river for the salmon to come because there was no other food. Well, there was food, but there wasn't a lot of food. Um, and so they, they had to have calendars that gauge these sort of things. And when I re- after a biological time, I gave a lot of presentations um, to scientific groups and fish and wildlife agencies and the tribes here in the Northwest. And I, I give the tribal councils and their own fish and wildlife groups. And I had Indians, Native Americans in their 60s and their 70s just crying at the table. And they said, we always had this, but no one believed us. Um, and it, it was in their traditions. It was in their stories. And it was in their all their rituals that they, they had. They didn't have a written calendar. It was um, in their practices and how they, they saw the cosmos. Um, and that's and I went looked at the caves, the, the cave art in Europe to connect um, those Native American concepts. And that brought us to this current book, which is before Orion finding the face of the hero, which goes beyond the biological clocks and the rhythms of nature and the calendars and all these things. And it takes us deep within ourselves to see where religion comes from, where art comes from, spirituality comes from, as well as astronomy and self-realization and a wide range of things that we believe that we invented in modern times, but we didn't. I'm a skeptic. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then well, I will a, a, uh, go ahead, Hannah. Uh, I was just going to say, I was, I was looking through uh, some of the things we wanted to talk. Um, one of the big topics that you hit in that second book is the mono myth, which, um, which I find is a really interesting concept because it's kind of the basis. Cause Chris here is a huge fantasy fan. I've, I've been in, 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 in the fantasy genres when I, much more when I was younger, but uh, they always talk about the uh, finding a box you know the uh, the whole idea of creating a storyline where there's a group of characters there's an item which is the important thing and there's a circular situation there's a there's a conflict there's growth there's um you know the the conclusion of the battle and you know that circular cycle it is a thing that is it's common in uh in movies and uh storytelling and I, I like the idea of that's, that's, a, that's a place that you, you kind of start the, uh, the, um, the book off as, as far as I know from what, uh, what I've been reading in the synopsis, is, uh, is like a major driving force of how we kind of organized our, uh, I guess, our imaginations. Absolutely. And that goes um, – so there is a so-called modern myth. And the modern myth was actually coined by James Joyce, but then was popularized by Joseph Campbell. And I don't agree with everything Joseph Gamp- Camp- Campbell said, but I give him credit for many things that he, he did. And what Joseph Campbell does, he systematized this concept of the story of the hero that goes on his journey. And so there's this person in a place of normality, Luke Skywalker, um, and he's he wants to go away to the exciting place, um, some, somewhere more interesting. And he goes off, of this, off in this journey, and on this journey, he meets um, helpers. He meets Obi-Wan and then Yoda. Um, and these are spirit, spiritual helpers, guys. These are spiritual helpers. And they give him magic. Um, they, they teach him the ways of the magic world. Um, and the, in, in the end, it's not really they're not it's not magic. It's things that Luke has with himself. But he also has, um, you know, an assortment of characters that help him along as well. Leia, Chewbacca, Han Solo, um, Obi-Wan and CP3O. And these are all this this concept of. Trout meeting a group of people on the journey that help you and assist you on that passage is coming throughout myths. Of course, the Wizard of Oz and Dorothy has her cohorts, and the Lord of the Rings is, the, is really the Fellowship of the Rings. And so we have we don't go alone on this journey. We we have friends that help us along the way, and the, the friends are um, 
all the different, let's say, psyches that are out there, all the different characters. It's the thinker. It's the feeler. It's the um, it's the muscle man. It's the you know, it's the the the, the weak mortal, or whatever. But all these characters um, come together, and they they as we learn on our journey, they do as well. And that falls into the concept of Jungian psychology. Um, and uh, and Jung is another. Jung was absolute genius. I don't agree with everything he said. Um, but he was a man of his time who brought us forth in many in many directions. And so this hero's journey, Luke Skywalker goes on the journey, has these helpers, and he, he goes into the Dogoba, he goes into the Dogoba cave. And Yoda says to him, uh, he always he asks Yoda, you know, what weapons do I need to bring? And Yoda says, the only thing you bring into the cave is yourself. And Luke goes into the cave and he fights, he, he encounters and fights Darth Vader. And he in his anger, he lobs off the, the helmet of Vader, falls to the ground, and then he sees his own face in the hel- in the helmet. And so what Luke learns in that experience, or we're, we're supposed to learn as the audience, is that if you fight evil with evil, you become evil yourself. And this, in The Lord of the Rings, um, Frodo is, is accompanied by Golem, and Golem's trying to kill him. But Frodo realizes that if he kills Golem, he becomes Golem. It's fundamentally the same story. And so on this hero's journey, the, the hero is encountered with these trials and tribulations. And ultimately, the hero you know, saves the damsel in distress, and he comes to face him or herself and face their own fears. And after facing those fears, the person overcomes some great obstacle, returns home to tell the story. And that's fundamentally the pieces of the hero's journey um, and this great monomyth that we find throughout the world. And sometimes the characters are human, such as um, – Luke Skywalker, but they can be a coyote in the Native American traditions. Um, we have all these different characters um, that we we draw from, and so that's that's where this, this this monomyth, this great story, comes from. And people all over the world have some version of the story, and that was really the, the essence of Joseph Campbell's work. And Joseph Campbell said, "Well, there must have been some core to this whole thing." And he said, well, maybe it was in the in the, you know, among shamanic societies in Siberia from, you know, 14, 15,000 years ago because Native Americans had it. But it's actually in these caves, deeper in the caves of Europe for 30, at least 30, 36,000 years ago that we, we can see the same stories. And not only they, do they have they play out the same way, the hero goes on a journey from point A to point B and back again, but they're the same characters as the Greeks told in their own myths. Yeah, and that's that's, that's kind of crazy. You know, I, I guess it goes back to an argument I've had with um, Christians before. And, you know, all the viewers of the, or the listeners of the show know that, you know, I grew up ultra-religious. You know, we were taught, you know, the Bible is the word of God, yada, yada, yada. The everything, nothing can contradict this, right? You know, but when I, when I started to reach out and actually decide that I really don't believe in this and got really serious about it, there was, um, you know, the story of Gilgamesh, right? And that's one sure. of the the stories that rivals, you know, some of the biblical tellings, right? And it almost feels like the Bible ripped off it and said, well, you know, I can make this a little bit better of a story. I can kind of give you a, a little bit more of an insight. And, hey, let me throw my dogmatic twist on it to make sure that, you know, you follow my religion and not, you know, whatever religion the people of Gil- Gilgamesh were, um, you know, into at the time. Exactly. So Gilgamesh is about 4,500 500- years ago and was dug up in the sands and the core story that we find that so if you take a literal interpretation of the bible you can go back a number of years and uh but the gilgamesh story um dates further back in time and includes the core element of the ark um or and the setting off the the dove free and the noah character which is given a different name in gilgamesh and what gilgamesh so young young and joseph campbell and others they had also been exposed to that story, and they that's as as far back as they could go in time to the to the ancient myths um, and so our our ideas of how far our psyche has progressed is we say, well, Gilgamesh is fundamentally the same story or same psychology as we have today, therefore we haven't changed in the last forty five hundred years. What happened before Gilgamesh has has been this big mystery. And so my, what my work does, it pushes back that in time by at least 30,000 years ago that we can see the same stories that we, we find – the fundamental stories find in Gilgamesh and in the, in the, in the, the versions of the Bible and everybody else's holy, holy, holy books. 
And so we, our psyche hasn't changed in, in, in 34, 36,000 years ago. And so if it hasn't changed in that amount of time when we first we find this art, maybe it hasn't changed in hundreds of thousands of years before that. So there is some deep root, there's some diff, deep root in time where we separate from being you know, the chimpanzee that can't tell a story to the people that we are today. And maybe it's those stories that are so important, those myths. And this is how I, I view the view um, religion. Um, so hold on to your seats, guys, right? We're not going to, you know, <laughs> I'm going to, you know, my, myths are important and they're, they're embedded in religions because they have a common, they have common elements of social mor- norms. When, when, when a society has two different mythologies, they're at war. And so the, the issue right now in the Middle East is you have the Sunnis and the Shiites. There's a split in their myth of what happened in their in their in the history of Islam, um, and it's that's what it is. And the difference between the fighting of the the Catholics and the Protestants in Europe for hundreds of, for hundreds of years was really a difference in the myth. Martin Luther had a different interpretation of the myth than the the uh, the Pope or the the Catholic hierarchy. So these myths are important because they keep us together. And be, and whether I'm not a religious person, but a, a Christian in Car- North Carolina can fundamentally relate to a Christian in the Vatican. They have the basic ideas. You know, one might be one is a papist and the other isn't, but they fundamentally have the same ideas. And so by having those same ideas, we have a we have cultural identities that we can we can um, we can relate to. So the U- the United States, our closest allies, overseas allies, is Great Britain, because it's another Anglican society. They come from the same Protestantism um, religion that we 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 um, our country is dominated by. It, but same, the fundamentally the same morality. And whereas we're, we we fear Islam because it's a different myth. It's a different morality that we really don't understand. And so what the myths do is they tie us together. And some very distant point in time when people didn't see each other, you know, for Christmas dinner or drive da- drive down to the club, these myths carry their carried them together for tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years, this story of the hero's journey. And so people who had never met before can sit around the campfire fire and tell the story of this hero's journey and they can point up to the night sky and the stars and and both sides understand the story it doesn't matter if the myth is true or not because it wasn't true what matters is that two people who had never met each other or their grandparents met each other came together at the campfire and joined to or collaborated and they understood each other and so when that this is not to subscribe that we should have one great myth of the world of one great religion that we should all follow. <laughs> I don't agree with that. But the reason, but we have fewer wars, we have fewer of conflicts when we have a common myth. And myths are not of just religion; myths are also of politics. You know, we have a myth today in the United States that we are a democracy. Well, Bernie Sanders has a completely different idea of a democracy than the Koch brothers. I mean, these guys are so, f- <laughs> but but we but. We share the same myth that in the end, that our votes will matter, and by our vote, and we will be defended. And our children will go to school, and you know we'll have running water and electricity, all these sort of things. It's the myth that holds us together. And if we, if if Bernie Sanders um, decided, well, I'm going to I'm going to follow my own myth and create my own country, and the Koch brothers did the exact same thing, we'd have a civil war, which was what we had between the North and the South. There was a split between the myth. Um, so the, whether the myth is political or it's religious, the, the, what, the myths are important because they tie us together. And that's what they, they kept us together for tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years. And so, so as a skeptic, okay, guys, ask the questions. <laughs> well, right out of the gate, just, just uh, touch off on uh, a lot of these topics and thoughts that you've got in your book and some of the things that you've been doing some serious research in, it seems. Is these are some of the tools that we've talked about multiple times as far as when we talk to people who deny evolution is that there are tools. These stories are tools. Religion was a tool to keep society together in small, isolated groups to help 
calm problems, help ease things, help sort of explain the unknowns and the Native American aspect that you gave at the very beginning of this. They didn't have reasons why the salmon came at this time of year. They didn't have reasons why the rains didn't come until later in the year. They, they needed some kind of spirituality, some kind of esoteric, some kind of amorphous reasoning. Why? Because they didn't have the science. But when you created these cultures, you create these stories, you create a tool that, social, that sociologists and um, that psychologists and anthropom- uh, anthropologists are able to, to discern after the fact to realize that people were unconsciously doing a lot of these things. We talk about the, um, the, the creation stories and stuff in this um, when we talk about the, uh, the Christian uh, and the, um, the, the uh, Judeo-Christian myths and we talk about the, uh, um, how that ties into Islam and how is there, there's more of a reason why we're really close to Israel than we are to Islam because the foundation of our religion is basically we have the, the Christians in this country absorbed is um, the, the uh, Israeli uh, uh, the Torah and that and so that that is closer to their foundation and so we still are closer to that uh, but looking at something like the Bhagavad Gita over in India and Hindu and looking at some of the Buddhist myths where it's kind of this uh, interesting philosophy of life and, and uh, equality and universality those kinds of things they're still different and far enough out there but those tools have existed for a really long time and that's part of the evolution of our mind that's what really interests me about what you have here is that you're going back past the written word and you're using images and um, you're using storytelling in things like um, what the ancient Egyptians used to use and what some of these older, older cave paintings are using. They're using visuals and, and uh, they were developing language and developing their first bits of communication and, uh, I guess, preserving a story through time. They're creating a written record of those myths and of that story so that later generations can also, uh, I guess, become part of that culture in a new way. And I, I, I'm guessing, is that kind of where you were getting this? Because you're talking 35,000, 100,000 years ago. That's where ago. I ended up. That's where I ended yeah. up. That's not where I started. I started with biological clocks and rhythms of nature, well, yeah. right? And uh, I ended up, I ended up fundamentally, or well, here's a, so let's shake this up a little bit, guys, okay? And let's talk about um, religion versus science. I mean, this is this is an important question. When we're on the show, we can do this. It's your show, okay? And, um, so let's look at the, the Big Bang. Okay, the, so the Big Bang is there was there was originally a singularity um, in in the cosmos, and from that singularity it exploded, um, and we 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 recognize that today because we have an expanding universe, as as dem, as um, shown by Edwin Hubble, uh, who now who's the Hubble telescope is named after him. Yep. So 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 well let's let's take that one step before that. Hubble got we started looking at it because of the work of Father Lemanter, a Belgian priest who had hypothesized an expanding universe based on mathematical grounds. And he had the idea in his head from the cosmic egg or the origin of creation, a, a, sing, a singularity of creation. And Pope Pius XII came out at the time. He was the Nazi pope. And uh, he said, you know, there this is scientific evidence of a creation therefore there must have been a creator but the story of the cosmic egg you talk about the hindu goes back to the vedic traditions it goes back to the in, in the chinese tradition pengu breaks forth from the cos from the, the cosmic egg and with his axe he separates the yin and the yang um in the, in the Norse traditions, we have a cosmic egg. As well as the Greek traditions, the Dogon have a cosmic egg, as well as the ancient Egyptians. So people all around the world have a cosmic egg. And, they, and through the cosmic egg, they explain that there was an egg before the chicken, right? Okay. <laughs> That's kind of yeah. a fun million story, okay? Well, we solved it. We got the answer right there, right? Well, That's it is. I'm going to flip that one. So, <laughs> Okay, so here, so let's, and so we in this image we have thirty four thousand years ago at the Gallery of this and thirty six at the Gore Matching. We have the cosmic egg. We have a man hatching from the egg. We have the birds. We have a man holding the egg. We have the cosmic egg. So that fundamental, the reason why all these people, um, all these religions, um, in the mythology have this story of the cosmic edge is because it goes back to a far distant time, at least thirty six thousand years ago. But, but we start off this conversation with the scientific. Um, discovery of the Big Bang through the expanding universe as observed by Edwin Hubble. Okay. So the question becomes now, do, does, do we, ex- I'm going to tell you, there's other, there's other ideas about the universe out there that are, that are um, um, spun in scientific circles. Do we most more, 
readily accept the Big Bang because somewhere in our psyche that we ha- we we look for that original singularity in creation. Can we separate the two? That's a question for the skeptics, guys. Okay, so basically you're asking that since that humanity, our brain, what we have evolved over time. So I like to say a lot of things like we find things like pyramids and societies all over the world. And it's part of because our brains are created fundamentally the same way. And uh, in what you found here, we create stories in fundamentally the same way. So you're basically saying that uh, the way our brains are set up and the way humans biologically have evolved and the similarities. I mean, look at the genetic code, how similar we are, that we are predisposed to finding a starting singularity point as to the scientific and then, then using science to find that point. So you remember at the beginning of the show, I said someone's going to ask, you can ask me the question. Yeah, you just did. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I, as I said, I've been at professional astronomers associations Um and um, psychics and um, paranormal people and historians, everybody asked me what you just asked me. Yeah, we're and, predisposed. Uh, that everybody, they, well, they ask, is, do we carry it throughout in our DNA? Okay. Yeah, memetic, memetic legacies and things like that, yeah. So the answer is, I don't believe so. Okay. Not, not, in, the way that, not in the way that we actually carry the, 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 the symbol, the, the carry the symbols per se. And this is how I this is how I I view it. And this is kind of a this is a very different way than anybody else that I can find is has come come up with a way to explain this. And I can do this because I can look, you know, I've got the teacher's edition of the book thirty four thousand years ago. Um, and I live in Oregon, in Portland, Oregon, near the Oregon Zoo. And we've got a um, wonderful zoo. If if you're into zoos, okay. If you're not into zoos, you know, just don't go to any zoo. Um, and we have a, there's a big lion area. And in this lion area, at the top of the heap is always this older male. The bottom is a young male. And in the middle is a bunch of females. Well, that's the, that's the societal structure of lions in the natural environment. Because the females actually go out to do the hunting while the male on top um, protects the territory. And when he protects the territory from other male lions who, if they kill him, they will also kill the young, okay, the, 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 the young lions, the cubs. And so he, he's, he's, the, he's the bully and he's the protector at the same time. Okay, so he's sort of like Trump, right? Um, he's the good <laughs> father, and he's the good father, and he's the bully. You know, he's the he's the mafia don, <clears throat> and that is the lion at the top. Well, in in this, if the, these lions are fed, there's no reason for him to be at the top. No one's going to introduce a lion that's going to co- combat him, and. Um, so why do they keep that social structure? Somehow they keep that inside themselves. And how I would say is this way, is that that lion who, who is at the top, he's actually the older, driven, testosterone male. And that creates him as either the patriarch or the bully. Okay? He finds that position in, in the story itself. And then the, and then the, younger, the younger male at the bottom, um, you know, he's learning from dad. Um, and he's he's and he's the women in the pe- in the in the pride are pushing him down, <clears throat> saying you're not ready for this yet, boy. Just hang out there in the bottom, you know, listen and watch. Okay, and so <clears throat> we have these these archetypal characters within these lions. So a- an- animal beings across you know bio- biological biological spectrum have feelings, they have thoughts. Maybe they're not as complex as ours, but they have thoughts. And they have personalities. And so these lions have all those personalities. And through those personalities that they have, they tell their story. And we can go look, you know, maybe we project, I project a little bit from my mind, but it's all there. And it's the same story that's told in, in the African savanna. And we still find, of course, in the Disney's Lion King. So we, we have these, we have these, um, these these archetypes within us, and these archetypes are built from the introvert, the extrovert, the thinker, the feeler, the sense of the perceiver. All these Jungian personality types that we now use in business through Myers Briggs tests. Have you guys ever taken them? And of course, I'm an extrovert, right? Um, and so we we have at the most basic level in our psyche, we have personality types, and those personality types actuate to become archetypes they become the the teacher the old and the young the teacher and the apprentice the mother and the child the bully and the hero and so we so do we carry this in our dna well we don't i would say that it's 
in the same way that we carry blue eyes or brown hair from our parents or, or, you know, being tall and lean or short and, you know, whatever. And so I believe that we, we don't actually carry the stories of that cosmic mountain of the pyramids that you earlier mentioned or transcendence as people have through, we transcend through the avionoid, the bird man to the, to the afterlife. Um, I believe that we, these, these symbols are in our world. The mountains are in our world, and we 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 want to climb the mountains to reach the great beyond. And that we we enta- we encounter we we to reach to our only way of flight prior to to um, balloons and airplanes were the birds. And so we projected our psyche into the birds that we could um, travel to a distant place. And yes, that's woo woo, but it's also a spirituality that people. Um, they got into the they 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 it became part of their tradition it to, in their belief you know i i live in here in oregon as i said and we have a port we have the timbers absolute best soccer player team that ever you know existed and um you know there's there's seventeen thousand people believing that the timbers are going to win their home games and they win two out of three of their home games whereas they lose you know one they lose two out of three of their away games and so we we can project this feeling of um, of victory onto the team, and they believe it. And by them believing it, we win our home games. And so is it is that woo woo, or do we do we get the the vibes, the faith, the feelings, and the energy from the people in our world? Yeah, and that's that's an interesting concept, right? And that was kind of when you had first contacted us. That was one of the things, you know, you'd been on some of the other podcasts. And I'll be honest, it's kind of hard to listen to some of these spiritual podcasts, right? Because I don't sure. see, I don't, I just don't see it in the same way. And and I guess, you know, it, it's kind of like one of those things like Sam Harris tries to normalize this, this spirituality for, you know, secular people, atheists, different things like that. I just don't, I don't, I, I don't know if it's just because I was too closely associated the word at birth, you know, but, sure. you know. I, I see that as is a downside. Like, you know, my connection to nature is through evolutionary processes. And the closest thing I can see to a God or to spirituality is evolution. And if, if that's the case, evolution is the shittiest God we've ever had, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's, here's an interesting example. Let's see how you, we actually are tied through evolution to um, very basic, more, much more basic animals. And there's a um, there was a, a biologist in Europe. His name was Nicholas Tinberg, and he won a Nobel Prize for his book, The Study of Instinct. And Tinberg, and by his window, had a fish tank with these three spine sticklebacks. It's kind of like the um, gangsters of the, the of the fish. And and every day that a red delivery truck came by, the sticklebacks went into defensive posture. And Sticklebacks and fish don't have the cerebral hemispheres that give us cognitive think, cognitive thinking. Their brainstem dominated. They're, they they're reacting to that red. Something deep inside them is saying, you know, watch out. Okay, and there's something deep. In, it's in the psyche of the, of the sticklebacks. Well, why do you stop for a red stop sign? Why do we? Why, why do you notice the red stop sign? Why do you? You know, you go and why does you know Burger King, McDonald's. DQ and everybody else, every other fast food chain use red. Okay, why does the the outline of Time magazine have a? It's in red. You know why? Why do we use why the red dress, the red car is exciting? Because it's deep in our psyche from a, a very distant time when we had the brain of a stickleback, a three spine stickleback. And so, in the same way that we we carry these this within our psyche of the stickleback. Um, that we're we're um, drawn to the red. Um, we we carry these same archetypal characters at the most basic level, which are our personality types. And you mentioned Sam Harris. I listen to Sam Harris. He's he's brilliant. Um, but here's the deal, and this is where um, Sam Harris and others they're only going back forty five hundred five thousand years. Five thousand years. They're only going back to Gilgamesh. And so they they're they're kind of you know trying to figure out. So they'll talk about Christianity and Judaism and Hinduism, all these sort of things, and Jainism. And, but what they can't talk about is where we actually come from, how far further deep in time, and where those those religions were founded on something else. All those religions are leaves on a tree. 
our our so-called spirituality, as we find in, in this Paleolithic mythology, goes back tens of thousands of years. And those are deep. Those are strong branches on the on the tree. Well, there's a root even deeper in time that we can't see. And that that root was probably some separation between the chimpanzee and the homo sapien. And that we we came to tell our first stories and we looked into the night sky. We projected our psyche. We saw the Orion as as the, as the hunter. And we saw um, um, Ursa Major as some sort of legged animal. Um, and they became the you know, these beings in the night sky. In this Paleolithic image 34,000 years ago, there is no th- – these people were animists. Um, there's no structured religion as we have in modern times. And the animists believe that the, the, the moon was a spirit and that the, the wind had a voice. And the mountain, the mountain was a sacred place where the gods dwelled. Well, not the gods dwelled, but the greater spirits dwelled. And one, if one climbed the mountain, they could commune to the to the great beyond. They believe that the stars were real bodies, and that when Ursa Major, the bear, is in the night sky, it's a reflection of when the the bears are walking around on the earth, and that one is um, one. They are the same, and that is the mind of the animist. And from that mind of the animist, we find all the, these Paleolithic images in the story of this hero goes on his journey. On this journey, he doesn't meet Obi-Wan and, and, and Yoda, but what he does meet he, is animals. He meets the horse and the, the lynx and the dolphin and all these animals help him on his journey. They give him strength. And the same with that we Timbers fans give strength to the team <laughs> um, and win two, you know, two, you know, two-thirds of the home games. And so the – the, the root of religion is animism. And so what we – everything in the last 4,500 years, we've, we've fundamentally made up or built upon earlier temples of myth from much deeper in time. Um, and so I'm – you know, people have literal uh, versions of any, any, you know, religious book. Well, you, buddy, you need to go back further in time because – these stories are much older and they're much it's it's not the story between two men a man who helps another man on his journey it's a story of a horse and a lynx and a dolphin that helps the man on the journey um, those are his disciples those are his his comrades and that's where we come from um, and that's where many people are seeking to return return to um, a more a state of um of animus or naturalism where we're, you know, we live among the animals as opposed to dominate and slaughter the animals. I can see that as being one area where, um, I guess you could look at as, as humankind started to gather tools and started to notice a distance between itself and nature that it would start to promote itself higher and higher away and further from the animals. And then a naturally, a a more uh, primitive state of human would, naturally see itself closer to those creatures, but un, un, uh, not particularly understanding why it had the uh, mental faculties it did, anthropomorphizing animals and giving them you know, human-like traits. It's something that we even still do instinctually when we talk about our pets and those kinds of things. But of course I wanted, we do. <laughs> you I wanted, got it. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to just nitpick one thing. You, you, you mentioned it twice in here. Is, um, uh, this, you, you, it, I don't know if it's intended, but it was uh, you had the chimpanzees into the humans as, a, as almost a linear trait on that one. Uh, the chimpanzees are one of the four sections of the great ape family. Sure. That um, so there are cousins as opposed to uh, something that would be a, a, a <laughs> sent ancestors is what we have. But anyways, um, but the one split. Th- there was a split somewhere uh, far yeah. back. In time. Yeah, yeah, and so, but I wanted to go back to because I don't think I, at least I wasn't satisfactorily. Um, you 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 alluded to the uh, the Big Bang as a place you know that that whole egg and everything, sure. um, and that you know that it doesn't have to be um something that's driven by. Uh, our religion, our understandings of the world. It's just something that we kind of innately uh, have to find. I will nitpick that a little bit because let's just say that, that another form of life could be found on another planet, on another section of the entire galaxy uh, or the universe. And we have things in, in our, on our planet alone, just a single organism taking over thousands of acres of land, these fungal uh, growths. And so let's just uh, ex- extrapolate on that. Like, let's say that there was a planet that had a single evolutionary creature that, or a single dominant creature that covered the entire thing. Like it could be a whole society of, of this type of creature, but it had a single 
intellect, a single mind or whatever. So this is a really strange thing that we have. It would still, if it had the ability to become as complex as necessary to find the mathematical rules and laws necessary to understand that there is a cosmic microwave background and there, as far as we understand, was a singularity where there was infinite mass, infinite heat, infinite density. Like, it, it doesn't entirely necessitate the biological processes and the evolution that we have on this planet as carbon-based life forms. The math, it's like uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson always says, science doesn't care what you think. It exists entirely as its own. The mathematical laws, the gravitational constant and Einstein's constants, those are things that exist outside of what we've been able to create as far as, like, let's say we, we started with the idea of a singularity and then we found it or we we're innately kind of guess trying to find that is that 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 exists whether or not we start from that position and so i was just curious if you could clarify a little bit sure there. absolutely so let's talk about it well first of all um a friend of mine brian keaton he has a book out lose the Nobel prize and his his book his work was based on this concept towards inflation that there was something before the big bang there was that spark and uh, physicists said well um, you know, really? why do we need to find the spark if we have the Big Bang? Well, okay. and so Keaton, so Keaton is saying, well, if we find the spark, maybe we can some, find something behind it before the spark. Okay. Which is an interesting concept. Now, there's, there's many theories about how the universe was formed. And in, in your scenario, you're, you're, you're describing a, a universe, hypothetically, right? And, uh, well, why other many physicists and I'm not one of them because uh, I'm not a physicist either. They say, well, there's a multi. There can be multiverses. There can be many, many, many universes. Why yeah. do we, why do we have to just have one Big Bang? Why couldn't there be something before the Big Bang? Why couldn't there be you know an infinite amount of those? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the reason. So back to the concept. Why do we we kind of like this idea of the Big Bang? Is because it falls into the storyline. That's kind of like in our psyche, the same story that we grow up, we grew up with. Um, there's a beginning and there's a, there's a hat, there's a beginning and there's an end. But here's a, that story of this, this, um, this singularity of this, this cosmic egg. It's, it was bastardized. The Paleolithic story is actually a little different. Okay. And the Paleolithic story, all these animals are actually, um, that I, I mentioned on, on this panel are all constellations in the night sky. Okay. And one of the animals is a great, the now extinct great auk, who lays this, who lays the cosmic egg. And the great auk is some, something like a penguin. It's not a penguin. Okay, the difference between a chimp and a human. Okay, they're, they're, they're you know, humans are chimps and penguins are great auks, but they kind of, you know, there's commonalities. Well, the biggest egg they would have had in Europe at the time of a bird was the great auk, because it stands like about as high as a penguin, and, and the egg is a little bigger than your hand. And we have this character holding this, this cosmic egg, which is just a little bigger than his hand. Well, in, in, the, in this, in this, in this paleolithic, story, paleolithic story, we have um, the constellations throughout the, in a, in a mid-June mid time period. Um, so we can see all, all these, you know, we have Hercules. We have, I'm looking at this right now. Hercules, we have Gia, Pegasus, um, Pisces, Cetus, Orion, Gemini. And we go, go through this whole thing. Well, in this story, there was no chicken before the egg or no auk before the egg, but it was actually when the great auk egg hatched. Okay? And so they looked at time um, not as a singularity of beginning of origin, but as a cycle. But some, somewhere along the line, we changed the story, we changed the myth. Or, or, we're, or we're, maybe we're just re misreading the myths, and that we, you know, we looked at Dogons and the and the Mithras and the um, and the and the and the ancient and ancient Chinese. Maybe we really just don't understand the story, the stories of the myths that they are, a, 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 they're circular, and that they they repeat each other, and that every year the the stars are reborn. But we can't think that way now because. We know that the stars aren't reborn every year, but stars are reborn, but not the, the constellations that we see. Um, and so we've gotten out of the head of, well, you know, everything, there's a, there's a cycle in the year. And that every year that the salmon come, and just before the salmon come, the swallows, the spring salmon, the swallows precede them by four or five days. And that's in, in, a, in a Native American myth in the Columbia Basin. And so that... Um, we, we change the story when we realize that the stars were not 
and projections or animals in the night sky that they were that they were spirits that we realized they were actually stars and then we had to say well if they're actually stars then they can't be reborn every year and thus we have to we we change the story of this cosmic egg to a singularity that begins everything and then so on and so forth becomes father momentor pops up with his math um his formula that shows there was an expansion of the universe and of course and then hubble um um, he observes it, but there's many, there's many theories of, of hypotheses of how the universe was formed or there are many universes, the multiverse, um, ca- carols, it's, that's, he's a big one on that. Um, so is, is there an answer to any of this? I don't believe, I don't think, I don't believe that we actually have the capacity to, to reason it because we're still stuck on the same stories from 34,000 fundamentally the same stories from 34,000 years ago, which we bastardized a little bit with um, changes in science that there, there's the, the, this fungi planet. What maybe there's other universes that have other fungi planets. And, um, and maybe there's, there's, it's just things we couldn't even imagine. Um, but we, we need, we still need to find that common myth and that common myth is of the big bang. Um, and so in, in more recent times, we actually – the universe is supposed to be contracting. It was expanding, and then there's, there's studies that – papers that show that, well, it's actually not – it's not really expanding that quick, and maybe it's even contracting. Um, and so there's there's many myths out there, but by us keeping well, – those have together, been pro- – the, the contraction, it, the universe uh, contraction, the steady state model have been disproven. Correct. We know for a fact that it's, it's expanding at a greater and greater rate due to dark energy, dark matter, and uh, – uh, a variety of other things, and they I, said that it's it's a cold entropy, uh, uh, f- complete entropy death for the universe. <laughs> is what it, well, 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 um, Carol w- would say just the opposite. He said those multiverses, and what, you know, one will one will collapse on top of another. Um, yeah, and well, and that's so, that's the end of a universe. So, like they've been saying that they postulate throughout our universe that once our universe reaches full entropy or complete entropy, where it's no longer uh, uneven, everything is completely and totally dissipated in heat, that our universe could separate into two, or we could collapse into make new ones. But that's that cycle you mentioned. But either way, that yeah, there's there's a variety of things, and um, I, I guess I don't know. I think this would just take a long time to to break it's down. It's a physics question. Things. But it, yeah. so, but it, it's a physics question. But even even though it's it's question of physics, but how did we came to the idea or on that path of the physics? It was through a myth. And for and and it, it was it, in fact the Big Bang when, when Father Amanda came out, the the League of Physicists and Cosmologists they were completely against it because they were saying this this is just another ploy by the Catholic Church to you know bring to prove religion with science so they were the skeptics and also it wasn't until years later so you know in in another another hundred years we might have some completely different way of seeing of measuring what we can't see even imagine today um and so the world we we change and so i'm not a um i'm not a big banger and i'm not a multi-universe i'm just sort of like well my mind's open to see you know what's going to happen next and um I'm ready. I'm ready for another myth. Well, I guess we're we're getting close to the time. But are you postulating that we wouldn't have the sciences we have today without the myths before them? We would. We 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 wouldn't have the Big Bang without the myth, because the Big Bang came from Father Lamanter, who drew it on the cosmic egg. Um, there were other theories of the universe at the time, and so um, yeah. Well, we wouldn't have actually. We wouldn't have had it. We, you know, maybe we would have had it ten years later or fifteen years later. But we wouldn't have had that time because it came from Father Lamanter, um, and you know, he forwarded the idea. He fought it out. Um, Einstein, dis- Einstein disagreed with him. Um, the greatest physicist of the time said, "You're nuts. You're just trying to sell us new religion." Um, and so. Uh- all I can say to that is that the Big Bang existed way before anybody in the fact that the church even created it, though. So that's the thing. It's like physics in the universe precedes all of our Correct. creations of myth. And so, I mean, it's once again, that that is a natural place. It's like 2020 hindsight. Like we talked about the creation egg and um, 
um, Nostradamus told us that there was going to be, you know, a fireball in the sky between two towers or something along those lines. Yeah. Like, I'm not a Nostradamus fan. I, yeah. I know that, but basically what yeah. I'm saying is that it's like it's really easy to find that creation story in a singularity, and then all of a sudden, when physics evolves to the point where it has the ability to find that, and that is the solution to to say that we would never find the singularity because of uh without having the religious myths that we had or without having those explanations of our simple universe our our small medium sized planet in front of a medium sized star moving at relatively low speeds i i just i had to disagree on that okay one. so here's this is a misunderstanding okay so we ultimately would have had such a big bang theory but we more easily came to accept it because we have that myth in our psyche. Okay. 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 I can understand that. Yeah. So basically that it's easier that, you know, Correct. we, we had thought of that, that, the, that the science confirmed it. Correct. So we, we watch, you guys watch fantasy stuff and you can relate to, you know, people riding on dragons. Um, and I'm going to tell you, no one has ever ridden on a dragon. Okay. It just, it's never happened, but we have that ability <laughs> to 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 kind of accept that in our imagination and um we'll even talk about it you know we'll play games against video games against each other that one person's dr- riding a dragon the other person's fighting the dragon and um we ha- we we have that ability that storytelling that mythic imagination within us um that allows us to step out of the um out of the box and become you know one in the game um and to um we project our psyche and so we, we, we can't, it's, it's this is mythic imagination that allowed us to find these common myths that kept us together to help that bonded us, that we could work together, we could play together. And then we didn't kill, we didn't kill each other all the time. And they lasted for at least tens of thousands of years. Cause I can see the same images for, from 30, 36,000 years ago to 17,000 years ago, you know, this, the same story. And it's only in our modern times that we've had these splits of mythology that we, you know, we're at war with each other, we're perpetual war, and we're fighting over these the differences in these religious myths. Um, and so this takes back to you know the theme of your guys. Like, you're like you know you guys are just like dumb with religion. I, I get it, um, and I I don't I don't um, I'm not a, I'm not against that idea. Okay, but if you got rid of the religion. Another myth would come along. Would that myth be communism, socialism, or democracy in America? Um, we're, we need the myths. Um, and what we hope is that – and we work towards is that the, the, myth, the, uh, the power, the, 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 the bad people in these myths, you know, that they are the, the villains um, and that are characterized in, in many religious and political leaders, that there's a checks and balances on them. Um, and so that we continue, we continue on. And of course that happens in the, the journey of the hero because he, he ch- puts the check on, he always fights the villain, whatever, whether it be Darth Vader or the dark Knight or, um, the dragon, um, or, you know, whatever, whoever that, that bad person is. And that's within us, um, that we, we have that ability uh, to put those checks and balances. So will we ever, will we ever not have religion? Um, I would say that we will always have religion and whether, and, and that's not to say from a positive or negative perspectives It's because me, much of what we believe we carry in through these myths. And, you know, it's possible that someday the religion might be of the Harry Potters um, and that someone, you know, in, looks back at all the good books of Harry Potter. Oh, these people believe that all these things actually happened. And they'll be carrying on new myths in the same way that people today, we carry on myths from tens of thousands of years ago. Um, and so I don't believe that there – I believe there will always be religion. There will always be this conflict between religion and science um, or rationalism and the spirituality. Um, and it's um, – and there will always be the skeptics and, and the, you know, f- fighting against the spiritualists and so on. And I believe that's healthy. Um, because it puts every, it puts each side in check with each other. Um, it's a different perspective than um, the hardcore skeptic, and certainly the spiritualists aren't going to like this one. Don't like it either. Um, so I'm kind of floating in space out there. <laughs> you can, maybe you'll be the new religion that everybody gets into. A friend of mine read the book early on and said, "You know, you're going to be a prophet." 
as, uh, <laughs> as long I'm as you don't take a, i'm not gonna be a prophet i'm not gonna be a prophet but what i what i but but you know we do have prophets in our time and certainly richard dawkins is a prophet sam harris are prophets they're not religious prophets but they're prophets are their own movements and people say well i believe in science um I, you know, I listen to Richard Dawkins or I believe in new age spirituality. I listen to Sam Harris. Um, and so there will always be uh, new prophets of, of the times, whether whatever end part of the spectrum that they fall. Um, and I certainly won't be with them because I'm kind of pointing at Young and Joseph Campbell and these pilots at Cave Artists and all these other people say, hey, guys, this was just done before us. We're 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 reinventing a wheel um, in a in eternal cause in a in a cycle of constellations that um, move, you know, repeat from one year to the next. Yeah, I guess as as we wrap the show up, the the only, I guess the last question I have for you is, you know, we, we've talked a lot tonight and we've talked about essentially myths. Do they come from, you know, where, where do myths come from? Do they influence the science or does the science influence the myths, right? And, yeah. and and some of me wonders, and in, 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 in just in speculating here, that if what what has always really been there, and if you it, to to me, it almost feels like the science, the 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 un, not being able to understand the logic of what's happening, has always been there, and that that to me almost feels like the myths are created as a way to understand how society works how things can come together because there is no better explanation you know and, and you could be right you know i mean socialism could be the new religion per se right we we could move into a socialistic era here which would be extremely beneficial for everybody living in, <laughs> in our society right now but on the opposite side in a hundred years maybe somebody will be smart enough to invent a different type of belief system right that allows to govern our political scheme that will be even more humanitarian than a socialistic outview. But I get well. That's what Stalin said. That's what Stalin said. That's what that was his. And Mao, Mao said the same thing. And, <laughs> it's okay. And, and well, and look now, we don't we don't subscribe yeah. to the same type of socialism as Mao sure. and as Stalin did. That's well, the Chinese they, do. Well, okay. We as Americans, <laughs> yeah. okay. Bernie Sanders is not subscribing to that right now. So anyway. <laughs> You know, you know what I mean. In, in, yeah, in, I see where you're coming from. Yeah, it, you know, this is this has been a great show because you and I, we just had the conversation that Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson have have on the big stage in the podcast. Yeah, you know, we we talked about except for with we, less sexism. How about that? Less Can sexism. I say that? There's yeah, no sexism. Less, yeah. In gender gender pronouns. Yeah, and uh, so we, we we had we had this is probably you've had a lot of great guests. But we're actually pondering questions, and I don't have the answers. I'm just saying what we what what, what happened 34,000 years ago, what they believed, and what happened hundreds of thousands of years for for that. I don't know, um, but I can, we can look at this. We can look at this textbook, teacher's edition from 34,000 years ago, and we can we can ponder things that we couldn't even imagine have considered a year ago. And um, w- you know, we're cover- we covered space tonight that and ideas that Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris couldn't even imagine. And they're they're still fighting over biblical stuff. And we're and, you know arguing these points of of you know d- divinity among Jesus and the perfect you know hero all this sort of stuff. But we've gone tonight we've gone back so far deeper in time um, that we're 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 on the cutting edge and that the new skeptic what is I mean there's a new skepticism out there. Skepticism out there. And you know, many many paths to follow, and, and maybe we could have another session at some time. And you know, because you know, there's more, there's more to talk about. Definitely. That's true. Yeah. Bernie Taylor, thank you so much for joining the show tonight. Make sure you all check out the links in the description. Before Orion, finding the face of a hero, released last year, an amazing book. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it on his website. Um, all the links are in the description. And uh, make sure you check out all of his other work as well. Bernie, thank you so much for joining us tonight, sir. That was great, Chris. Thank you.
You've been listening to a presentation of Cellar Door Skeptics. Check us out on Spreaker. CellarDoorSkeptics.com <laughs>